our first scripture reading. I'm going to read uh, Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 down to chapter 2 and verse 4. When we look at Joseph today, we're going to see that God spoke to him uh, through visions. And the writer to Hebrews introduces uh, his letter, his sermon, uh, by speaking to us about uh, the revelation of God and that God makes himself known. Hebrews 1, beginning at verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he had inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. We'll take your Bibles and turn to Genesis 37. Genesis chapter 37, and our reading will be the first 11 verses. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of of Jacob's family. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made him an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were building sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Who hasn't dreamt of greatness one way or another? 
Like many children, I dreamed of playing hockey. Those who have visions of ice and skates, sticks and goals, don't dream of a career in the minor leagues. They dream about playing in the NHL. They dream about scoring the big goal and winning the Stanley Cup. Children dream about being a celebrity, doing something so that everyone knows their name and wants to hear about them. We want to see ourselves on the news or on magazine covers. We want to be the hero. Joseph has dreams, but they are not the wishful hopes of a child, the starstruck aspirations of youth. Joseph's dreams are a revelation from God. They are an insight given to him from the God of the future. The God who says, Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I said my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. God revealed to Joseph what was going to happen in the future. And so today we will begin our new series in the life of Joseph by looking at his dreams. And after we work our way through the narrative, we'll reflect on what the narrative has to teach us. So let us begin by setting the context of Joseph's dreams. And our first point is Joseph and his family. And we see this in the first four verses. The family lived in the land of Canaan, the land that God promised to give to Abraham and his descendants. As the narrator moves into talking about Jacob's family line, he draws our attention first to Joseph. He does not tell us about the oldest son, but about the eleventh son, because Joseph will be the one who is used by God to protect and preserve the family line of Jacob. Joseph is the one who plays a vital role in the plan of God as this chosen nation is formed. The story starts with Joseph tending the flocks with his brothers. We know from other accounts that Joseph's brothers were not godly or upright men. Reuben, the firstborn, had an affair with one of his father's concubines, Genesis 35, 22. The second and third brothers, Simeon and Levi, played the role of vigilantes by deceiving the town of Shechem, killing all the men and plundering it as retribution for the shameful treatment of their sister. That's Genesis 34. The fourth brother, Judah, had an affair with a woman who he thought was a prostitute, but was really his daughter-in-law, who was veiled because she was trying to make a point to him uh, because he had lied to her and was deceiving her. That's Genesis 38. All that to say, morals in this family are lacking. These brothers are a rough, self-seeking group of characters. Is it any surprise that Joseph brings a bad report of them to his father about their managing of the family flocks? While there is no surprise about the report, what is debatable is Joseph's motivation in his interactions with his brothers. As I've been reflecting on this man's early life this week, I realize that I may have been hasty last week in saying that we don't have a biblical record of his sin. I try to give people the benefit of the doubt. And as I studied Joseph's life, I came to the conclusion that it's really hard to give him the benefit of the doubt in everything he did in his early life. Now, by the end of his life, he is an example of uprightness, of character, of integrity. He is a man in whom we see the grace of God at work. But some of the things he does early on, especially in the passage before us, are difficult, shall we say, to give him the benefit of the doubt. This word that is used for, um, for bad report is also used as slander in other places in the Old Testament. And so the question is, what kind of report really was it that Joseph gave to his father? Uh, did he maybe stretch the truth a little bit? Did he inflate what they were doing? Is his motivation to give the report so that Jacob will uh, look upon Joseph with favor, will exalt him over his brothers? 
As we look at Joseph at this time in his life as a young man, he seems to be a combination of pride, foolishness, and immaturity. He needs God to work in his life and to prepare him for future spiritual leadership and to root out his own sinful tendencies. And really, if anything, Joseph is a real encouragement to us because we see that he responds to the work of God. By the end of his life, he is this man of integrity, this man whose pride and foolishness and immaturity has been worked out. And he is now a godly, mature, wise man. You know, there are times when we get frustrated with ourselves, when we wish that we could be better and do more, but we are reminded that God is at work, and we see God at work in the life of Joseph. And he is the same God who works in us and through us, who prepares men and women to do that which he has called us to do, just as he prepares Joseph. And so we go back to the story of Joseph, and he brings this bad report to his father about his brothers. And the response of his brothers is that they are infuriated. From their perspective, their little annoying brother has gone and tattled to daddy. He's thrown them under the bus. Who does he think that he is? And so they look at him with hatred. And anger. And their hatred only intensifies in the next verse, in verse 3, because Joseph receives a special gift from his father, from Jacob. Jacob has special affection for Joseph because he is the son of his old age. Not only is he the eldest son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel, but as the text tells us, there is this reference to the son of his old age, which may be a way of saying that Jacob believes that this will be the chosen son. This will be the son through whom all of God's promises will come to pass. And so he gives him this ornate robe. The rest of the brothers look at their robes, their clothing, and then they look at Joseph. Not one of them has ever received something anywhere near as special as this. This is a clear example that Joseph is favored and beloved by his father. He is Jacob's special son. Parents should never show favoritism to their children. A child needs to know that they are unconditionally and equally loved by their parents. And anything else will always lead to heartache, competition, and future problems. Jacob should have known better. He had seen the damage that parental preference had done in his own family between him and his brother Esau. But he doesn't learn, and he carries on the same harmful and hurtful family tradition. Joseph's brothers hated him so much that they could not speak a kind word to him. Every time they saw Joseph, there he was wearing that coat, and their blood boiled just a little bit more. This is the family setting. This is the main tension in the plot of the story of Joseph and his brothers, the hatred that they had for him. They are full of anger and malice towards him, for he has offended their pride, their position within the family, and their own relationship with Jacob. It was a family of tension, and very little was done in order to minimize the hostility, either by Jacob, by Joseph, or by the brothers. And the tension was only going to increase as we come to our second point, which is Joseph and his future. There are already two strikes against Joseph. He he brought a bad report, and he was given a beautiful robe showing the father's affections. And now we have strike three. He receives a revelation from God. God spoke in various ways in times past, and the way that he spoke to Joseph was through dreams. He receives two dreams of greatness in which God clearly tells him that he will be exalted over the rest of his brothers. One would think that Joseph would be aware of the animosity that his brothers felt towards him and that the prudent course of action would be to tread softly around them. But that's not Joseph's style. 
and he excitedly tells them of his dream, and not surprisingly, their hatred only intensifies. Should Joseph have kept silent? Should he have been sensitive to the feelings of his brothers and tried to keep at peace with them? But on the other hand, he had received a revelation from God. And like it or not, God's word is to be declared. We are not to keep silent because the truth might offend. But we are to at least speak the truth in a loving, winsome way. Well, what Joseph did was he gathered his brothers together and he relayed his dream to them. And so he tells them his first dream. He says, we were out in the fields working together and we all had made these sheaves and all of a sudden my sheave was exalted over the rest of them and your sheaves came over and bowed down to my sheave. What a great dream this is. And the response for the first dream comes from the brothers and they correctly interpret it. Are you going to rule over us? They know the message of this dream is that Joseph himself will be lifted up over them and that they will bow down to him. This infuriates them. The thought of their younger, annoying, pretentious brother reigning over them. He is favored by their father and now he is favored by God. And remember that These boys, the brothers, have grown up witnessing the conflict between Rachel and Leah. This conflict will have been ingrained within them, seeing this ongoing tension. And now, six of these boys are sons of Leah, and they have this son of Rachel coming and saying that I am going to reign over you, that God has told me this. Inconceivable that God would do such a thing. They are disgusted at the thought and mock the idea of Joseph ruling over them. Then Joseph has another dream. Repetition, in order to emphasize the truthfulness that this will indeed come to pass. And once again, he tells this dream to his brothers. Hey, this is even better. I got another dream to tell you guys. He does not show discernment and humility towards them, but instead, he doesn't seem to have a problem lauding his position as favored by God over his brothers. And like the first dream, it has a clear and simple message. Joseph will rule over his family. He says that in the dream, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. Once again, Joseph is at the center of the dream receiving praise and adoration, not only from his brothers, but from his entire family, including his father. Joseph is excited at the thought that God has great plans for him. This time it is Jacob who expresses his dismay at the dream. Will your mother and I and your brothers really bow down to you? Despite both the brothers and Jacob having these responses of uh, dismay and disbelief and rebuke, at some level, they did recognize the dreams of Joseph as a revelation from God. And that is seen in the two responses described in verse 11. His brothers were jealous. The only reason for them to be jealous is if they thought there was an element of truth in what he had said if they thought that the dreams of Joseph were ridiculous, if they were all lies and a fabrication, then jealousy wouldn't be their response. They would have felt derision. They would have felt contempt. They would have felt scorn. But it wouldn't be jealousy. They saw that God had greater plans for Joseph than for them. And they were jealous. And Jacob despite his chastisement of Joseph, we are told that he kept this matter in mind. He did not dismiss the dreams as foolish fantasy, but he remembered them. He thought about them. He reflected on them. He wondered, really, what was going to happen. And so this is the story of Joseph's dreams of greatness. We want to spend some time thinking about learning from narratives. 
What relevance does a 4,000-year-old story have for us today? Well, here is a helpful quote, which I have also put in the bulletin, concerning how we are to study and apply narratives in our lives. The writers say, Biblical narratives tell us about things that happened, but not just any things. Their purpose is to show God at work in his creation and among his people. The narratives glorify him and help us to understand and appreciate him and give us a picture of his providence and protection. At the same time, they also provide illustrations of many other lessons important to our lives. So as we approach narratives and seek to understand them, and their relevance to us today, we can ask three questions. What lessons do I learn about God and his work from this passage? Number two, what lessons do I learn about how to live in this world? And third, what lessons do I learn about Jesus Christ? Learning about God and his plan. In the narratives, we learn about God. We learn about what he is like. We learn that God has a great eternal plan of redemption. And each narrative fits into that plan and develops the story of salvation in some way. In these verses, we learn about God's providence and his revelation. What providence means, God's providence, is his working out of all of the affairs, all of the circumstances, all of the things of our lives and that go on in this world. God is working them out so that his plan, his purposes, will come to pass. That's why in the verses I read earlier from Isaiah, God can say, I tell you the end from the beginning. God knows how things are going to work out even before they begin because he is the one who orders all of the steps. And so in the life of Joseph, it is God's providence that enables him to give Joseph these dreams. Because God knows what he's going to do in Joseph's life. Joseph doesn't know. Jacob doesn't know. His brothers don't know. But God knows. God is the God of providence. And he is also the God of revelation. God reveals the truth about himself, about the future. He lets us know his plan, what he is doing. And that's what he does for Joseph. And so he reveals these dreams to Joseph. At the time when Joseph first received these dreams when he was 17, he had a pretty easy and cushy life, didn't he? He was the father's favorite son. He probably was able to get away with a lot if he was so inclined. But his life is going to get a whole lot harder. He's going to be rejected by his brothers. He's going to be sold into captivity. He's going to have to go down into a country where he knows no one. And for a while, he's going to thrive. But then he's going to be unjustly accused and thrown into prison. Well, how does he persevere? How does he make it through? How does he become the man of faith that he becomes? Well, he can remember the dream. He can remember the revelation that God gave to him all those years ago that God promised him that one day he would be lifted up. That God had great plans for him. And it was necessary that Joseph went through all these trials so that he might be matured. So that he might learn what it truly means to follow God and to be a man of faith. Well, God The God of Joseph is the same God as the God today. He's the God of providence and the God of revelation. And in in the word of God, we are told that he is working all things out. We looked at that a few months ago when we went through Romans 8, Romans 8, 28. And we know that he is working all things out for the good of those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. God has promised that to us. He's promised an eternal heavenly home for all those who trust in him. And because he's the God of providence, we know that he's going to bring it to pass. We know that these things will come true. 
And so just as Joseph could have confidence as he's you know, thrown in that caravan, bouncing his way down to Egypt, just as he could have confidence when he was in the dungeon that God had a plan. No matter what circumstances we're going through, no matter how difficult life is, we know that if we are in Christ, there's a glorious day ahead. We can have confidence in his providence and in his revelation because he is the God who does not change. So we learn about God and we learn about his plan. We also learn about life and its challenges. The narratives of the Bible are not simply moral lessons. They are not included solely to teach us how to live. They are to be seen in light of the working out of the great plan of God in human history. However, that does not mean that we should ignore the practical lessons of the narratives. These are real people living real lives, making real mistakes in their real relationships. And we can learn from both their failures and their successes. And in this account, we learn about navigating human relationships, family relationships. We first see, see the sheer folly of Jacob in having a preferred child. There may be a temptation for a parent to prefer one child over the others. Maybe it's because this one particular child is so much like you. Or maybe it's because this one particular child is not so much like you. Or maybe it's because one child is easier to get along with or has a more favorable temperament. Or maybe one child is more successful and you enjoy telling other people about their accomplishments. Favoritism is easy to do, but it has tragic consequences. It results in tension, in pain, in hostility, in feelings of loneliness and of being unloved. It results in unnecessary rivalries and competitions. Parents and grandparents need to be on their guard not to have favorites and also to not even make it appear to have favorites. Adding on to the theme of navigating human family relationships, we can ask, how should we deal with tension within our families? How can we avoid having the sort of dysfunction, the hatred, the tension, the anger, and the animosity that we see in this family? It's so great that these brothers didn't even want to speak to Joseph. We want our homes to be homes of peace. We want our church, where we are the family of God, to be a place of unity. But we need to begin with humility. We could spend hours and hours talking about dealing with family tensions. But we need to begin with a place of humility. And what we see in Joseph and Jacob and the brothers again and again, is pride, is self-seeking, is putting self first. And so how do we avoid having a family situation like theirs? Humility. One writer argues that we cannot become more humble through a sheer force of our will. We can't say, I'm going to be humble and I'm going to work really hard at being humble. Because when you're focused on even something like humility, you're still looking at yourself. The author says, the only way to grow in humility, truly, is to take our eyes off of ourselves and meditate on the beauty and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Humility is a matter of perspective and seeing ourselves in right relationship to God. We need to be cultivating humility in our lives by fixing our eyes on Jesus Christ. We need to have a proper, a biblical perspective of God the Father God the Son, ourselves, and other people. And as we see ourselves and others rightly in our relationship to God, this affects our understanding of who we are and our relationships with others and is foundational for having peace and harmony. As we view ourselves as needy sinners in light of who Christ is, that we needed him to die on the cross for our sins, how can we be full of pride when we think of ourselves in relation to other sinners, other people who need grace just as much as we do? There's no reason for us to be full of pride or to be arrogant. We are all needy. 
in need of the grace of God. And so we are to avoid the pitfalls of Joseph and his brothers, who were consumed by pride and jealousy and a desire to one-up each other, and instead were to strive for humility, which leads to unity in our families and in the church. And then the final lessons that we can learn are about Christ and his salvation. So when we look at narratives, we think about God and about God's great plan. And what does this narrative teach us about these things? We can think about ourselves and living our lives, even in the 21st century. And what can Joseph and the rest teach us about the human condition? Because really, even though the times have changed greatly, human heart doesn't. You know, we have the same struggles, the same difficulties, the same tensions that they had all those years ago. And then finally, learning about Christ and his salvation. Every page of the Bible teaches us about Jesus Christ in some way. And even in this story about Joseph and his brothers, we learn about Jesus. The Old Testament is preparing for the Messiah. Jesus says that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. All of the Old Testament is written with an eye to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we think of this account of Joseph's dreams of greatness, we can see what God is doing is he's preparing the people. In God's plan, the people need to go down to Egypt. And so what God is doing by giving Joseph these dreams is moving the story in that direction so that Joseph will first go down to Egypt and then the brothers will come down later and the people of God, the one from whom the Messiah will come, are being built up. They're growing. They are maturing into a people which will happen in Egypt and then they will come out into the promised land. And so this story is instrumental in God's preparation of the people from whom the Messiah will come. But the story also teaches us themes of salvation, such as forgiveness. And here we see the depth of the offenses. The offense of the brothers how offended they are at Joseph, how angry they are at him, how much they hate him. They can't even speak kindly to him. They despise him so much. And yet at the end of the story, there is forgiveness. Joseph forgives his brothers. How that points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. The immense infinite forgiveness that is found in Christ that can wash away every one of our sins and remove them from us as far as the east is from the west. We see Joseph, this great figure of forgiveness. And we are reminded of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That because he died, because his blood is shed, we can be washed white as snow. And so, we are reminded our eyes are drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ when we think of Joseph as we go through the narratives. And so, as we continue, and we'll continue in the coming weeks to look at the life of Joseph, and even in your own readings of Scripture, as you come through the narratives, do so with these questions in mind. What is this account teaching me about God? What relevance does this account have for my life today? What does it teach me about human relationships, about my heart before God? How does this narrative fit into God's great plan of redemption, his plan of salvation? How does this text point me to the Lord Jesus Christ? What does it teach me about the Savior? May we be in the word. May we be reading it because God is the God who reveals himself, who makes his truth known to us. And he is the God who has given his Holy Spirit to us, the spirit of wisdom and understanding to teach us what we need to know so that we might be children of God, so that we might live for him. Let us pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Joseph. We thank you for his life. We thank you that he is a man of integrity. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that we would learn, that we would learn about you, that we would learn about the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would learn about ourselves, and that we would apply these lessons to our lives, that we would be in awe at your grace, at your forgiveness, and our Father, that we would serve you faithfully. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name.